disclaimer. The views of the guest and even the host sometimes are not necessarily the views of the Work With Me podcast and Ruse advisor. Welcome. Ah, work. The interview. Preparing for the interview. Picking your final candidate. Going over the offer. Training. Being let go. All things work related from the employee and employer side are fair game here at the Work With Me podcast. Interact with us at workwithmepodcast.com, email us at bob at rusevisors.com, or lorindy at rusevisors.com. Your tough boss is Lorindy Ruse. Your slacking employee is Bob Stey, And the fun starts now. How you doing, everybody? Yes. The Work With Me podcast, Bob Stey, Lorindy Ruse, all your best friends. Here at WorkWithMePodcast.com, 1023HC2, KKNH, where Classic Rock lives, and Tick Radio. And yes, who will be our next affiliate or affiliates? We got a bunch hanging out there on the On Deck Circle. We'll announce that very soon. A hey, uh, special show today, but first of all, let's thank Tavia Sharp. Was that fun? Special show today, but first of all, let's thank Tavia Sharp. Was that fun or what last week? Now, Tavia, you taught me so much about how to dress for success and all that. I'm actually wearing a normal shirt on my Zoom calls now. It's been a, I'm not wearing my, uh, you know, like my, my Morrissey T-shirt or an all ripped up <laughs> white dirty tank top. Still not wearing pants, but that's another thing. But uh, that was a lot of fun. I learned a lot from her. And uh, she is the pride of Wilmington, Delaware as well. So here in the United States, if you're listening or whenever you're listening, things are kind of weird right now because the election just happened and we still don't have a winner, yet we sort of know who's going to win because the votes keep coming in in favor of Joe Biden. So we're sort of in a strange period right now where if aliens came down to the earth and said, take me to your leader, we would shrug our shoulders. (laughs) They said that we'll probably know. So very strange time as always in the United States. So that's how we're going to Canada for our guest today. I am pumped up. My buddy and the guy I've worked for for two years, Mark Stiles, he's checking in from one of the greatest places, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Never been there. It is beautiful. It is so beautiful out there. Mark's got two companies, Stiles Executive Search and um, Lacation. He's going to talk about both of those and life up in Canada in the Atlantic region, as they call it. Hey, reach out to us, Bob at rusevisors.com, lorindy at rusevisors.com. And the last announcement before I go into my little story is, this will be Lorindy's last broadcast. See, I pause for special effect. The other people are like, what? No. Her last broadcast from New York. The next podcast, she'll, her and Mark will be making that wonderful move to Los Angeles. So I might even open up once Corona ends for some big guests we can get in studio too. So we do wish her a safe trip to LA, but she will be with us in a little bit. Too, so we do wish her a safe trip to LA, but she will be with us in a little bit for her last New York interview. So, this is the Work With Me podcast, and once again, workwithmepodcast.com, 1023HD2, KKNH, where Classic Rock lives, and tickradio.com. Now, instead of a work story, I'm going to uh, share a personal happy story, and it involves the election right now because I get the opening of the show and I can do whatever I want. And also, it gives me also another chance to promote the upcoming book that I'm working on, Manhattan, Bronx, Riverdale. <clears throat> and uh, still looking for the right publisher. I've spoken to two right now. If you're a publisher and you want to invest in something that's going to be wonderful, you contact me. I like that self-plug there. So back in 1992, there was an election going on between uh, current president George H.W. Bush and a little unknown Arkansas governor named Bill Clinton. And at the beginning of the year, and risky, because I thought it was going to be another wipeout like four years ago, and the four and the 12. So when Clinton ran, everybody said, all right, you know, it's not going to win. But then the economy tanked, almost as bad as today, if not worse. And Bush's uh, popularity went from like 90 to 30. And Clinton ended up winning, of course, and serving two terms. But uh, something magical happened the day after the election I didn't expect. So I'm going to read this from the rough draft of another story from my upcoming book. And this is a, and once again, this is a rough draft as well, so a lot of this will be changed. So also get your lips wet because you're going to say, whoa, 
Not only do I want that book, I want to publish it. <laughs> All right. This is from a chapter called Famous Elected. I'm going to take you back to the year 1992 by Bob Stey. It was Election Day 1992. In my mind, elections were just as big, if not bigger, than the Super Bowl. I became obsessed with politics working with my family on the Michael Dukakis failed 1988 campaign. I was obsessed with politics working with my family on the Michael Dukakis failed 1988 campaign. I was obsessed watching news reports every night and glued to every paper. I remember the heartache when Bush won Missouri and won over 270 electoral votes. The Democrats could win anything but the presidency. But here we were, me and a few liberal colleagues, tracking and watching history from the sixth floor common area at East Hill. A few months ago, we started a Young Democrats Club, where I proudly served as vice president. We had one ugly fight with the typical Republicans on campus, but we devoted much of our time to getting people to vote. After all the scandals, controversy, and pitfalls, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton had a pretty solid lead in the electoral and popular vote over President George H.W. Bush and Ross Perot. He was a third-party candidate that ran and actually got a lot of numbers. It was now up to America to decide. We had a tag board electoral college sign, and we would color states and results when they came in. The early results started coming. He was not only winning the states in the Mid-Atlantic that voted Democrat in 1988, but he was picking up southern states as well. While the states were coming in and we were high-fiving each other, Kent, the president of our club, introduced me to a journalist named Bill. Bill was observing us, and we had a nice conversation about my upbringing and why this event was so exciting to me. I had to cut our conversation off when they called Michigan and Pennsylvania for Clinton. He was nearing the magic number at 270. Around 11 o'clock p.m., Peter Jennings and ABC made that call after coming back from commercials. We have another projection to make. We now project Bill Clinton will be the next president of the United States. Ohio put him over before the big numbers came in from the West Coast. I was jumping around like a madman and hugging and high-fiving everyone. The Republican lock in America was over. A candidate I supported won. Life was awesome. We watched President Bush give a very positive and diplomatic concession speech followed by Vice President Dan Quayle. The president-elect came on afterwards and got us pumped up again. I was President Dan Quayle. The president-elect came on afterwards and got us pumped up again. I was up all night watching the news and answering calls from Baltimore by saying, We effing won. It was a great day to be alive. I was tired but had an energetic boost in my walk the next day. I went down the street to pick up a copy of every New York paper for a collection of the victory. As I was walking back to campus, people were congratulating me and asked me how it felt. I assumed they were talking about the election victory. However, there was another sweet victory I would find when I got back to my room. As I was glancing through the papers, an article in the New York Newsday caught my attention titled, Students Apathetic? Not This Year. The opening line put a huge smile on my face and butterflies all over my body. As the networks continued to call the results in for Bill Clinton, Robert Stye started to literally jump for joy. I had to do a double take as I read on. I didn't sleep at all last night, the 22-year-old communications major Manhattan College claimed, in Michigan. In 24 hours, my campaign won and millions of New Yorkers read about me. You know, that's all I wanted. Ah, those were the days, weren't they? And now, we're going to talk to a gentleman from Canada who's going to tell us about the good life and someone who's visited the whole world, it seems, Mark Stiles. This is the Work With Me podcast at workwithmepodcast.com. Lorindy, I'm real excited to have this next guest with us. I've known him for a few years. Uh, we've already had a guest on from Romania, and we've had guests all over America. So we're putting our thumbtack north of the border for the first time today. So at least our map's going to stay up. Calling us from the beautiful place of Halifax, Nova Scotia, he runs Styles Executive Search and Blaycation. We're going to learn all about it. It is Mark Styles. Hello, Mark. Hello. How are you doing? We're good. We're glad to have you with us on the Work With Me podcast. And um, one thing about you, you're a true Nova Scotian. You take so much pride in your... Oh, how are you doing? We're good. We're glad to have you with us on the Work With Me podcast. And um, one thing about you, you're a true Nova Scotian. You take so much pride in your Atlantic region background. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your time at um, Arcadia University there. Okay, thanks. Well, first of all, it's Acadia University. Uh -huh. uh, Arcadia is, you can call it Arcadia if you want, but it's Acadia. Um, actually, you've probably heard of the Acadians. They were the French group that when Nova Scotia was founded, the French and the English were fighting for many years. So somehow our university got the name 
Acadia. So I think it was because of all the uh, French uh, influence that was in the province of Nova Scotia. So I grew up in a small town called Port Williams, which is about a five minute drive. By the way, it had about 1200 people. And it's a five minute drive from the uh, semesters, it would double to about 7,000 people. So I grew up in a very small rural area, a beautiful Annapolis Valley. It's, 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 um, it's known for its wine region, it's, it's um, um, fishing, it's farmland, and actually the, the university itself. So it was the kind of perfect place to grow up. We had all kinds of um, fun playing soccer in the summertime, hockey in the wintertime, and uh, chasing after girls throughout whenever we were in between. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally. Now, Ideal yeah. it, right? Yeah, it was, it's absolutely perfect. And, and in fact, so I moved all the way down the road, 50 minutes away to, to the big town of Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I live now. And um, the whole province has that 1 million people. So out of, you know, and um, the whole province has that 1 million people. So out of, you know, the, the almost 40 million that live in Canada, one million of them live in the province of Nova Scotia and about 700,000 of them live in Halifax, greater Halifax. Now you have visited over 55 countries throughout your work and personal experience. What are your favorite places and where do you still want to go? Well, thanks for asking, Bob. I, you know, as you know, travel is one of those wonderful things that I, I am lucky enough to have a job in the recruitment business that lets me travel, but I also have a job where I take, send people on wonderful holidays through my vacation travel. And vacation is, is a portmanteau of the words bucket list and vacation. So it's, it, it, don't do a staycation, well, even though that's what we're doing, and do a, a vacation. So where do I like to travel? I, I think probably my favorite place that I've ever been you know, it's, it's not simple to say one because, uh, you know, cycling through Angkor Wat jungle, you know, with my family, you know, last December was one of the most amazing experiences I ever had. And it was just literally going through these thousand year old temples on my bicycle through the jungle with, with, a, uh, with a guide and stopping for, you know, a coconut that was freshly cut that was amazing. But Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe has to be one of my most favorite. So it was like, I think I went to Africa four times that one year. And um, South, South Africa, you know, Cape Town, I went shark cage diving. It was one of these really cool experiences. But when I saw Africa, you know, Cape Town, I went shark cage diving. It was one of these really cool experiences. But when I saw the the size, the pure power of the Victoria Falls um, River when it came down and, 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 and collects at the Zambezi, it is unbelievably overpowering experiential. So those would be the two tops. Now, where haven't you been yet that you'd like to go? Well, let's see. Um, I haven't seen the Stanley Cup final being played in Philadelphia I know I may be waiting a while, <laughs> but uh, but realistically, I, I I've been to Iceland, but I want to go to Greenland. Greenland is like I think one of those special places I've always wanted to go to, and I'd like to go to Bolivia and Argentina as well. So to explore some more in South America would be of great interest to me. Dal's executive search and Blake Hayson joins us in the Work With The Podcast at workwiththepodcast.com, 1023 HD2 KKNH, where classic rock lives, and tickradio.com. Now, Mark, you do business with companies and people all over the world. Tell us a few cultural differences that you notice and different work styles as you work with people from all over this free world. So in Canada, you know, we, we do things a little different than every state in the United States. And I think, I don't want to summarize Canadians as all the same because we're not actually culturally it's quite different in vancouver and, and toronto and montreal as it is in halifax but in recruiting for example 
you know, into New Jersey, as you are familiar, um, it's a completely different type of search. So you're typically getting to the point quickly. You're, you're answering quickly how much it, the position's paying. You're not having a conversation about what motivates you in your conversations about the hard facts quickly. Whereas in Nova Scotia, you know, you're going to talk about your mother-in-law. You know, what, what uh, did you do last weekend? You know, and then it's going to get to the conversation around compensation. So it's, it really does make a difference on geographically where you're recruiting for. And in England, you know, you have to be certainly very polite. It's, you know, you're, you're giving the privilege of having a conversation with them at first so that you're not coming across as trying to get to the point. So you have to really be, it's a good question because you have to understand that. Uh, to do a good job, effective job, you know, creating the sizzle to the candidate for the opportunity. Because if you connect with them and understand, you know, where they're coming from and what their motivations are, it does absolutely create um, a, a better conversation that you can then dive into. Mark, I love what you shared about the connection aspects. Uh, at Roost Advisors, we always say that we are not always selling, we're always connecting. So we call it the ABCs, always be connecting. And I also really connect with what you said about uh, that people that engage with us have given us the privilege of conversation. And I think it's something that universally at a very basic level, most of us can connect to. And I think it's good wisdom uh, for our listeners, whether you're an employee or an employer, to recognize uh, that privilege of connection and that privilege of conversation, irrespective of what your role is in the company, also people that you're working with, clients that you're serving, vendors that you're working with. So would you say that that has been one of the things that's been a great earmark for your success in both your vacation business or your vacation business, as well as your recruiting business or your vacation business, as well as your recruiting business, this real deep connection to the privilege of conversation. Yeah, it's, I, I never really thought of it like that. Um, you know, I grew up in a family that had a university professor father, and we used to invite um, at Christmas time when the university students would go home. Um, well, the international students actually couldn't go home for a for Christmas because it was only a three week break. So they weren't gonna go back to Singapore or Malaysia or Bolivia. They actually, my parents invited them over for Christmas. So we, we invited them into our home and uh, learned, you know, I, I learned all about travel from the kitchen table. And I think, I think opening up early in, in my life, you know, as a teenager learning from other people and asking questions because I'm interested, it really is helpful in both reflected upon, you know, having that upbringing. That's really interesting, Mark. I grew up in a minister's home. And so we were often entertaining parishioners, uh, traveling evangelists, uh, circuit uh, preachers. Uh, so there are a couple of things that I really resonate with there, with you there. And, and that is that, uh, it's more important to be interested than to be interesting. At least that was kind of my experience growing up. And it wasn't just about children weren't, you know, were only to be seen, not heard. It was really, my parents, I think, set up those situations for us so we really could learn from other people and have that kind of uh, larger worldview experience. Because I also grew up in a town population, 3000 people. We fought, you know, we had our own garden. We were each responsible for our rows. And so it was this whole idea of tending and nurturing. It was this whole idea of tending and nurturing, which leads me to my next question for you. Uh, it seems that I understand from Bob that you also like to coach and continue your work with college students as they start their personal journeys. Would you say that that was partly your attraction to that was partly based on your growing up experience and, and these opportunities to connect with students on a deeper level? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I had the opportunity to learn as a teenager um, about places and parts of the world and religions and tribes and things that I had no idea about. 
and uh, or even would have learned about in school. So, but as as a father, you know, of, of a almost twenty year old and a twenty four year old, two boys, and they're kind of carving their pathways. I can put myself easily in their shoes, and I've done that for years in in for, for students, for example, that are are on the right pathway because maybe they're graduating from university or maybe they've got a um, IT diploma or something. But what they don't necessarily have is a, a course or even um, the confidence to to learn how to go get in front of the right people. So a lot of times, as you can imagine, in executive search, we're not recruiting typically for junior positions. Um, but, you know, I have a philosophy of you get back what you put out there and you treat your customer like, like a king and uh, it'll come back in spades. And I think this is, you, you, would, you would, in your business, if you've been in this business for a long time, you would know this as well, that um, you, you, you might not get paid from your candidate, but your candidate might be your best client someday. So, so if you take the time to respect be your best client someday. So, so if you take the time to respect your client, which is your candidate, in, when they're young and teach them and point them, um, it'll come back, but you don't do it for that reason. It just actually naturally happens. And if, so some of my favorite conversations with, with someone that just graduated from university in business, for example, and they're, they're looking for a job and they're, they're sending a resume on Indeed or they're making a connection for the first time on LinkedIn and they're trying to make a, a relationship happen and they don't know how to do it is to really peel that the layers back and ask them, well, what are they trying to accomplish? Like, what, what is it that they want? And then getting them to actually open up to you to say, I want the job and I need to get known. So put yourselves 20 years ahead in that position. Who's going to stand out to you? It's the person that, that maybe on a different light, maybe they, they resonate on an interest level that is different than the candidate that you sends a resume. So I, I provide them with like real life examples, but also give them a lot of homework to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. You talked about this, you know, this young uh, student or someone just entering the workforce, something that I also like to encourage uh, younger professionals to look at is find peers that are in the types of companies or positions that could benefit you so that you can grow together side by side because that person may be on par with you this year but three years from now they could be in a different position that could benefit you um that's a really really smart i also wanted to talk about what advice would what other advice would you give to a young professional or maybe even a mid-career professional what other advice would you give to a young professional or maybe even a mid-career professional that you're not quite where you want to be, especially when it comes to like growing your network, what advice would you give? I think you have to really understand what they want to do and, and hyper focus and pinpoint answer around that. So if they say, I want to move up the ladder, well, everyone does. I want to um, um, make more sales. Okay. So what, what motivates you? Tell me about when you get up in the morning, or you're going to bed at night, what, it, what do you think about? So when you find out those questions, those really, uh, I think things that make, make a person tick, then you can provide guidance. So if you find out, for example, that someone is interested in um, you know, sporting equipment, and that is really something they're keen on, for example, but they're in sales and they're selling like um, maybe they're selling dog food and they're not interested. They don't even like dogs. It's a job, you know, as an example. So, but on the weekends they go skiing and they're, they, they absolutely love fishing and their cars are in that business. I, I always say, look, what's stopping you from, it's something you're really passionate about. What's stopping you going to do that? What, what's your hold up? And then you get them to answer the question. The holdup is you didn't, they didn't know the job exists. 
well, how did you get this job? Well, I applied for it. Okay. And you got the job and you're going to stay at that job for the rest of your life. Is that what you're going to do? Like you just, you have to just get them to think outside the box and then give direction. I always sit, my father actually taught me successful people hang around successful people. And I think that's significant in, in what your peer group does as well. But I also add one more successful people do the things that unsuccessful people are afraid to do. And if you can step outside of your comfort zone and, and go introduce yourself to the president of the equipments that lives in the next town and tell them all the reasons why you're interested in it and, and be honest about it and, and ask for their help. I think you'd be surprised at where that might lead. Yeah. That's great advice. What I heard you say was, you know, what do you really want? And what's stopping you from really going and getting that? The, the chances are that what you want, someone probably has done before and you can explore and find someone you know, to model. And then successful people hang around successful people. So going back to the idea that we're the average of the, you know, we are the, the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So we can constantly be looking at how we can not only level ourselves up relative to who we're hanging around, but what am I doing in personal and professional development? So I become one of those people that successful people want to be with. Right. And then also, that's a great point. Right. And then doing what other people are afraid to do. I always say you'll only be afraid one. I always say you'll only be afraid one time because on the other side of that fear is the opportunity that you've been denying yourself. So work through the fear and you only have to do it once and then then you'll be on your way. So incredible. Now, one more question that I'm gonna turn it over back over to Bob. One more question I had for you is that do you, some, some countries really encourage what we call walkabouts. You know, you graduate from college or before you go to college, at some point during that time, before you really sink into your professional career, you, you do a walkabout. Some of us do it much later and we, we do things like walk the Camino or the Appalachian Trail or something. Do you feel like that travel is an important aspect um, for professionals of, of any age in order to, to make them more valuable to themselves and then to the, the people that they would serve? The walkabout, is that referring to for career? Yes. Like taking a bit of time to go find yourself before you find your career path? Yes. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yes. I, I think that's, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that everyone needs to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do believe there's something to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that doesn't necessarily have to be a travel uh, related thing. It's just maybe, it, maybe it's art. Maybe it's they've never had, they're in business, but they're creative and mm -hmm. they've never had an artistic opportunity. So maybe that artistic opportunity is just to go hang out at museums and learn from, um, from people. Maybe mm -hmm. they take a pottery class on their own. But I agree, there, there has to be, uh, you have to blossom your interest level because the schooling only teaches you a specific thing. Your parents only teach you a specific, you know, direction. Religion teaches you a specific thing. So, so you know, to really grow and, and open up and travel will do that. So, mm -hmm. so absolutely, uh, but not for everyone. Right. So, yeah. You gave some great options that the, the it's really a journey of exploration, whether you physically travel or you travel down to your local pottery studio, whatever that is. I, I hadn't considered that perspective and it's such a great perspective that that we can do that journey of exploration and, and digging deep um, in a myriad of ways. And you just presented that so that we have, Bob, it reminds me of our career coach that we had on Terry Lynn Smith from Drafts Consulting that you find a career with a purpose and not just a paycheck. And all of these things that Mark, you've been speaking about on the Work With Me podcast today, gives us some additional tools and recipes for how you might be able to do that. Incredible. Well, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I also wanted to, to mention one. Well, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I also wanted to, to mention one more thing about, uh, about the similarities in you know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I've got two businesses, but I didn't start my career out with thinking that way. You know, I kind of had to carve the pathway, had to be carved. 
but they're really, they work well together because executive recruitment deals with high net worth people that have a bucket list. They need to work hard and then they need to play hard. Although when they play hard, well, we, we, we present luxury private travel design for those people through my vacation travel business that allows people to go experience something very special with their family, with you know their, their spouse or with their multi-generational group. But what's interesting about the both of them together is that when you recruit, you're asking really, you have to ask very deep questions. So I think they work well together and I didn't even ex expect them to, to work well together when I started this whole pathway, but they do. And I'm really happy about that. So sometimes you have to get to a certain point in your life to find out where you're, where you're good. Um, but I didn't know that when I was 22, that's for sure. Now, if you ask certain people in my family, they say I've been doing a walkabout for 30 years now. So I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'll, I'll find myself one day. I swear I will. We're, we're with Mark Stiles on the Work With Me podcast at workwithmepodcast.com, 1023 HD2, KKNH, where Classic Rock Lives, and also tickradio.com. And for Tick Radio and for KKNH, you can get an app, download it to your iPhone or your Droid. And all weekend long, you can listen to these wonderful uh, podcasts anywhere. And if you want to listen to some of the older ones, go to Work With Me Podcast. So you have no excuse not to listen, listen. Now, Mark, you've done so much traveling, but I bet you've never been to a stranded island before. So we are going to place you in the stranded island and limit you. So if you could only eat one food or one type of cuisine, what would it be, Mark Styles? It would have to be Asian. So I'm going to, when I say Asian, it would have to be flavorful. It would have to be fresh. Uh, I would say so it, may, it may be even Indian, it may be Southeast Asian, but it would be Asian persuasion for sure. What about one book to read? Oh God, okay. Um, not really a book reader. I read enough resumes every day to be completely <laughs> honest. Uh, so uh, it's funny though, my mother would say to me, you know, there's a great book that you should read. Well, as soon as she says that, I zone out and don't bother. But it's not because my mother says to do it. But if there was a book to read, it would be on travel. Okay, let's just say, yeah, it would be about learning about the, a new destination that I wasn't destination that I wasn't I wasn't sure about. What about one movie to watch over and over? Fast Times at Ridgemount High. Oh, that's one of my favorites too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can, uh, I have such great memories of going back as a teenager watching that movie. It, it, recently, it was, uh, it was done on a Zoom call, I think, with uh, some of the original actors and then some other famous actors playing other people's parts. I don't know if you've had a chance to see that. No, but, I've got to watch that. You know, there, you know, Sean Penn's there, but he's not playing Spigoli. Spigoli's being done by Shia LaBeouf. And, um, and I think he gets in the part very seriously stoned when, he, when he's doing it too. So, mm. it, it's, 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 so yeah, Fast Times would be a good movie to watch again and again. And since you're on the Stranded Island, we'll even let you wear the pirate hat that uh, Hamilton wears at the fish restaurant. And since you're on the Stranded Island, we'll even let you wear the pirate hat that uh, Hamilton wears at the fish restaurant. How about a TV show or series to watch over and over? Uh, Sopranos. And that is just a classic, you know, every episode makes you actually, it dives into real life. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's about mobsters and so on, but it, it makes you go deeper. I think it's an interesting, well, well done series. And one band or musician to listen to. Oh God. I would, I mean, if they're, if they, if they're still alive, I'd say the stones. <laughs> they're never going anywhere. They'll be a lot yeah. past any of us. But well, you, you, can you imagine interviewing the Rolling Stones on an island? How cool would that be? It's like to give Keith Richards something to do, right? Yeah. Well, we call him the mayor of Nova Scotia. It's Mark Stiles. And when he's not learning about history and having some pizza, to talk about Stiles Executive Search or Blacation. Oh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, so our website is stylesexecutivesearch.com. S-T-I-L-E-S. The Blacation uh, website is blacationtravel.com and it's B-L-A-Y-C-A-T-I-O-N 
travel.com or just blakeation.com will find us. And it shows a whole bunch of really cool places and op options for people to travel and some of our preferred vendors um, that we work with internationally. Well, Mark, thank you so much for hanging out with us today on the Work With Me podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for having thank me. You. Go Flyers. Thank you for listening to the Work With Me podcast with Bob Stye and Lorindy Ruse. Original score by Mark Ruse. The show has been edited and produced by Bob Stye. If you have a comment, would like to advertise, be a guest or an affiliate of the Work With Me podcast, 